So thank you so much for being here today. I'll be presenting on the woman, the garden, and the fight against <laughs> hunger. And I know that there are those of us here today who would like to know where the men are. So please stick with me through the presentation and you'll find out. They're somewhere within this story. So the study that I undertook was of food intake patterns and contextual factors related to household food security in Murinda, Gasaba, and Rangi villages of Nyanzalak in Burundi. And in the process, I led a team in implementing the Keyhole Garden. And today, I present lessons that I believe will serve to inform nutrition-sensitive agricultural intervention, planning, and execution. Before we, before we answer a lot of these questions, we have to talk about global food security, where realizing global food security alongside environmental sustainability has been described as the greatest challenge faced by mankind in the 21st century. So the word greatest really has such an enormous uh, presence that we, it cannot really be ignored. And what is food security? According to the World Food Summit of 1996, food security is defined when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious foods to maintain a healthy and active life. And it is built on three pillars of food availability, which is a question of quantity and quality and consistency, food access, a question of resource availability to obtain appropriate foods for nutritious diet, and food use which is that of knowledge based on basic nutrition, care, water, and sanitation. Now, this is often the face of hunger that is related to food insecurity. The story behind this image is that of 80-year-old Sudanese refugee, Agedi Jamush Tunguris, from Mugum village in Bao County. She reclines on her bed in a makeshift shelter in Yusuf Batil refugee camp while some of the elderly were left behind to fend for themselves in war. Agedi arrives safely in South Sudan. However, she is malnourished, recovering from diarrhea, and repeats over and over to her family how much she wants to eat even a small piece of meat. UNHCR Community Service Associates saw to it that Agedi, who was too weak to go for herself, to fend for herself, received food that day from, that came from the World Food Program Feeding Initiative. This photo was taken by B. Sokol of UNHCR. Yet this image just showcases one side of hunger, that of acute hunger, the result of high profile crises like war or natural disasters which starve a population of food. And guess what? It only accounts for 8% of hunger victims around the world. What do you see when you see that image right there? The story behind this photo is that one of my respondents and her child. I titled this image, My Tenth Child, where she, and the commentary of this goes, she had not had anything to eat for two days. Yet as she gazed into her tenth child's eyes, I sensed both hope and joy. I envisioned hunger being overcome. 79% of economically active women spend their working hours producing food through agriculture, yet women and children are often victims of hunger. And how do we therefore define hunger? We must think of it at the alarming levels that it's at, where two billion people worldwide now suffer from hidden hunger. And we must become aware of this invisible form of hunger which has become more than just an empty stomach. So together with the Episcopal Relief and Development, Cornell University, the kind funding and support from the AWARE program, the Bradfield Award, the province of the Anglican Church of Burundi, the Naudi program for international studies funding, we carried out work in rural Burundi with the aim to realize food security, improve nutritional status, and overall well-being and health of families through a pilot project of kitchen gardens that were initiated in Nyanzalak commune of Burundi. This is a map of Burundi, which is a country in the heart of Africa, a landlocked country in the Great Lakes region of Southeast Africa, bordered by Rwanda to the north, with Tanzania to the east, and the Democratic Republic of Congo to the west. This is often the face of Burundi, and when you talk to people, they say, 
Uh, they talk a lot about the genocide, which also affected Rwanda. And according to a 2011 World Report, as a consequence of social political instability, Burundi has lost nearly two decades of revenue growth. And so we had to set study objectives to design a process for evaluating the impact of program activities on household food security and hunger, to design and implement pathways that link agricultural practice to interventions with nutrition-related outcomes, and to build program documentation, logistics, and partnerships. And that is also the beautiful image of Burundi, a place that I really did fall in love with, and I had never been in all my life to this place that just borders my own country. And this is where we worked in the beautiful hills of Murinda, Gasaba, and Rangi villages of Nyanzalak. For our study, we had a purposive, a purposive sampling strategy where we surveyed a sample size of 117 respondents, 39.9% of whom were from Murinda, 29.9% in Rangi, and 30.8% from Gasaba. Our primary research uh, focused on household, the household hunger score with the aim of um, having with the aim of establishing a baseline of what we were working with in this region where we found a moderate hunger score and which we are trying to work through to, to see whether or not our findings were accurate or whether or not our respondents really understood the questions that we were asking given that our own visual observations of the situation uh, tended towards a more severe household security situation, household hunger security situation. We also had a dietary diversity score of which we are currently analyzing and a crop diversity study. But this is why I'm here today to talk about the Keyhole Garden Bank, which we started and which hopefully we'll learn from today. Before I went out for my work, I worked uh, in a class with Professor Prabhu Pingali, who advocates for agricultural nutrition pathways. And this conceptual framework of having household uh, incomes connected to household food access, connected to individual food intake, and to individual nutrition. And it shows us that agricultural interventions are right there in this pathway, and which we must consider as part of our work as we frame our interventions. Of particular interest was this concept of micronutrient and food availability, where we looked at our households, agricultural diversification, diversity in food production, and interventions as a donor organization to create this kind of saf safety net programs. And this is the third part of this grid. This is what the garden looks like in picture <coughs> form. And you look at the, it's a very American like, you know, you're thinking, oh, where did the, where did the, the metal stuff come from? Or where did the cardboard come from in, in somewhere like Burundi? But this is because it was developed by a professor in America, Dr. David Tolman, who's been working on this research in Texas in some of the hottest climates in America and has been very successful in growing vegetables around the year because of what she describes as a, a, a self-watering, self-fertilizing gardening system that utilizes limited space and uses water quite efficiently. This is the vision of the garden that we had for Burundi and this is what is existing in Lesotho. They have been very successful in working with this concept in the northern part where it's extremely cold, close to Ithaca-like uh, weather conditions. And that's how it looks from the top. And when I saw this, I thought, this should work. This must work. Now that was my first mistake. This must work. And I should not have thought this way. Anyway, we did set up this work in, in the places where you see the pink uh, stars. And we had a GPS mapping exercise. And you see all the areas where we set up the gardens in, in that locality. This was our team. And our group was made up of 10 women per, per group. And we had a structure of a savings group. And this is why we call it the, the garden bank. And I'll explain more what this meant for the women and for us. A day in our work, day looked like that. 
a very simple life, very fulfilling days. I do miss the women a lot, but it was more than just construction. It was conversation, it was uh, interaction, it was questions that came through to me and which we were able to now think about the process critically, looking at the difficulties that we encountered along the way from just the rigorous and very intense process of construction. I, I, I would sleep like a log after every one of these constructions and I could only imagine what these women were going through, having to feed families, having to go back to the farm, having to do all manner of things. All I had to do was just show up there and go back to my room and sleep. This was what a construction looked like. And one of the biggest challenges with this was the soil quality and the water availability. We had to fill that up with topsoil that wasn't really in existence. And that we had to have an aerated soil structure we had to have organic waste that we did not necessarily have much of because we were working in a, ret a predominantly returnee area, uh, which is uh, Burundians who were once refugees in Tanzania, and so they didn't have that much land or that much productive land. This is how it looks from the top, and you see the central basket where we got as much organic waste as we possibly could. And this was what our sowing exercise looked like, where we, we, we did encounter challenges with sequencing the crops, whether or not even we should have sequenced them was one of the questions. Because now reading up on home gardens and the, the diversity that home gardens require to thrive, we, we questioned our move to sequence these crops. This is what our first, one of our first gardens looked like after a few months or should I say weeks, and this labor-intensive process worked differently for various parts, and this is where I say that there's so many sides to a story and so many sides to a coin, more than just two. The gardens were built and the, the people were very positive about them and there were positive signs and them, they, them saying that they wanted to exchange this kind of knowledge with other villages, but as I said, there was that side of the story where when it rained, the garden was literally swept down. And after all that hard work, it really, really felt that we had done something wrong. And then some more failure came when we realized that some gardens were empty when we had actually given seed and we'd given inputs and implements and really our sweat and blood went into it as that group of women. But when I looked through the reflection work of my friend and my colleague, Emily, who is now working in Burundi, it gave me a sense of hope that there was actually an outcome out of this. Crop sales were recorded for Lenga Lenga, which is the amaranth, aubergine, onion, tomato, and carrot, anywhere from 900 Burundian francs to 6,000 Burundian francs don't get excited yet because every Burundian franc is 1,500 to the dollar. And it is unclear up to this point how much quantity yielded and how much profit was identified as a result. And that forms part of what the next structure of this work is how to identify the, the, pro the proceeds that come from this kind of work. But the biggest excitement, I should say, out of it all was that something did come out of it that we didn't anticipate or that I didn't anticipate. And in reflecting on our work, we found that out of 49 of the 60 gardens that were established, a farmer association had been formed as a result of our training of the Grameen Bank Savings Model. We had had this training with the women in our mud church construction. We had set up uh, PowerPoint presentations and, or, and there was this cloth on the wall. And the kids just could not believe that something could show on a piece of cloth. They all wanted to touch it and the women too. But we had such a great time learning and for them to see what a carrot looked like them to see what a pumpkin looked like. It humbled me to the fact that there's so much to learn and so much to teach when we learn and how much we have a responsibility to do that. And the Grameen Bank model teaches us about the successes of Bangladeshi women 
with raising money, with raising uh, families, and with putting money into livestock and, and vegetable production. And as a result, farm associations were formed in this place in Burundi where membership and uh, function and goals and policies were set, not just for women, but, the, but also for the men, as decided by the women. This is where the men come in. And this is where, again, we have concerns and optimism about the goals of nutrition in this project, whether or not it will be seen as a means of revenue or whether it will be seen for what it was intended, and that is as a nutrition function. Now, there's also an individual and group investment contribution that is taken up by these groups. And they, have, they are currently taking on a project that includes raising funds to rent a plot of land for tomato and aubergines. And one of the pre-existing groups actually purchased three goats, which have since had five kids. What I learned most was that my responsibility in this space was to share knowledge. And I learned that I had to let the community own the knowledge and decide what to do with it. And I had to step back and be humble enough to know that I had done my part and that whatever would continue would be as a result of collaborative action to form an innovation that they could actually sustain in the midst of the, the, the climate problems that they're experiencing with the rains and in, and in making it better, but from their perspective. It opens the discussion of how this garden can be that source of collaboration and can be that source of food, can be that source of revenue, but can also meet the greater goals that we want to achieve that are set within the Millennium Development Goal strategies of eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, of promoting gender equality and empowering women, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, combating HIV and AIDS. The home garden for me and in my, and as I continue this pursuit of my study, continues to serve the needs of women, children, and men in vulnerable households. And our objective is to work with this kind of idea in the pathway as prescribed by Professor Prabhu Pingali. We must continue to work to meet the micronutrient food needs of these vulnerable groups, to see that there's a potential for household income, and to encourage the allocation of resources. And now I shall leave you with a video of a part of our entertainment sessions after service. And I love that guitar. Thank you very much.